the shot. hundreds of thousands of Stay COVID home. breakthrough Nationwide, cases. Nationwide, the pace of hospital COVID. admissions is at an all-time high. Tonight, the COVID what crisis is overwhelming hospitals. What do you do to prevent the spread of infections? The so-called breakthrough infections are rising. What do I do? So this goes to the ethical principle of autonomy. So medical, profession, medical ethics uh, say autonomy is a, is a key principle and physicians hold that sacrosanct, which means that the doctor doesn't decide what happens to you, you decide what happens to you. That principle gets a bit misinterpreted because the um, uh, infectious disease risk to others is affected by that personal choice. So I try to tell people it's a little bit like you have a right to drink alcohol if you're older than 21. You have a right to drive a car if you have a license. You do not have a right to drunk drive and harm people. Another ethical principle has to do with justice. And the two sub-principles which are in tension are the principle of equality versus equity. Equality means we all have the same share, we all have the same risk, which means that I have the right to risk uh, to refuse a vaccine as you have a right to accept one. Equity, on the other hand, means that we spend our resources and we create a, 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 a differential res in resources to help people who can't help themselves. Mm -hmm. So in this country, there's a large number of people who cannot be vaccinated and a large number of people who, if vaccinated, aren't going to have the same reaction, HIV people, transplant people, etc. So equity would say that for the small inconvenience of a vaccine, you can save lives throughout our nation, lives of other Americans who deserve to be saved. So vaccine mandates have been around since the 1700s when we had smallpox that was wiping out people. This is a long history of having communities say, we need you to take this vaccine so that we can be healthy and we can conduct our business. So this is really about personal responsibility. And it's about people understanding that we need 70% of the population to be vaccinated before we can be secure enough to begin to live in a more normal fashion. It's very clear when we hit that point with people being vaccinated, it will be a game changer. We'll be back to not having to use masks and social distancing. But until we hit that 70% mark, we're gonna to have to continue with masks and social distancing. And so truly, this is about responsibility. This is a safe, effective vaccine. And I'm, I'm hopeful that people see it as a patriotic duty, that they want their community to be well and to be healthy, not just their immediate friends and family, but their whole community. Well, I guess um, first one that I have on here is how is there already a vaccine for COVID, but not HIV or cancer? Um, well, this is a really complicated question to answer because uh, the challenge here is we're talking about different, very different types of diseases. Um, COVID is simple and straightforward when it comes to vaccine production. It's one virus that causes uh, that disease. With HIV, the virus attacks the immune system. So the normal things that we would do to create a vaccine don't really work in that case. We've been trying to do it for decades. We're just not there yet. When it comes to cancer, uh, we like to think of cancer as one disease, but it's really a combination of a lot of different diseases, different causes, different ways that it's spread, different cell types, things like that. So uh, it's not quite as simple doing it for cancer. It's something that, that we're working on. Uh, we're just not there yet though, because it's a much more complicated situation. So in this case, it's a, an easier disease to develop a vaccine for. <laughs> In 2003, when we had SARS-1, the SARS-1 epidemic, had an, it was another virus, a, a coronavirus that had almost an identical genome. There was a massive amount of research at the time looking at this specific virus and targets on that virus that we could use to induce immunity to protect you. But then in addition, a lot of times it takes literally years to get enough people to enroll, enough people to enroll in a trial to even get it started. We had so many people enrolling that they had to actually refuse people. It, it, it was insane. So it wasn't years to get people, it was immediate. So for example, on Pfizer, 44,000 people. And if you look at Moderna, another 30,000 and, and multiple other companies and trials, there was no problem getting people. The other issue was financing. So financing often is a big deal. It can take years and years and years for a company to get enough money to run some sort of trial and to hire good quality scientists. Well. You know, if you look at Operation Warp Speed, there were billions of dollars 
not hundreds of millions, but billions of dollars that were given to companies that have a proven track record of success. This is a brilliant, brilliant endeavor between thousands of scientists beyond the entire, around the entire world that have joined together to make sure we can fight this battle and win the battle. I can tell you both me and all of my colleagues and thousands upon thousands of scientists around the world, we all uniformly agree that this is safe. Everything that has been done to, uh, to authorize this, the most recent vaccines and the future vaccines, the safety studies have been done like they've been done for decades. What we're doing to accelerate things is we are making large batches of the vaccine in case the vaccine works so that we're ready to go and we can give it to a lot of people. By putting more resources, more people, you can do things quicker. And the scrutiny that's going into the data by the FDA, by the sponsors, by the CDC, by all the health authorities is, is the same scrutiny as is used in the normal uh, vaccine process. This vaccine was developed in record time, but it was only possible due to the 15 years or so of prior research on other coronaviruses, including the SARS coronavirus 1. So they built up on 15 years of research and then put the best people all over the world in developing these vaccines and had literally every single possible assistance from the government. So it's not hasty um, and it's, it's safe following the clinical trial data, following the FDA review of the uh, vaccine candidates. And I vouched for myself as an OBGYN, as a woman, as a virologist, that these vaccines will bring protection, will help us decrease the burden of really bad illnesses that come from COVID-19. I certainly get a lot of questions from my patients asking about the safety of vaccines. Is it safe to take a vaccine for COVID-19 when I'm trying to get pregnant? And if I am pregnant, is it safe for me, a future mom, or for the fetus I'm carrying, the future baby? And my answer is yes, the mRNA vaccines are safe. Actually, the technology isn't very new. It's been around for well over two decades. It won't bring any harm to your developing fetus. It's important amongst all communities and communities of color that we improve our knowledge and we educate ourselves. Learning that, you know, there have been uh, several independent studies outside of the pharmaceuticals as well as the government and the robust amount of clinical trials that they've done with patients of all ages, races and ethnicities has really provided me the confidence in receiving this vaccine. The thing that made me make my decision and the decision for my family, I can tell you that my wife and both of my children are vaccinated, is that the risk that you run from getting COVID and then having a serious complication from having COVID is much higher than your risk from the vaccine. What we've seen in terms of vaccine reactions uh, are very mild uh, and really your risk benefit profile is just much better at getting the vaccine rather than holding off. And so that's why I believe so many of us uh, really want to urge our patients, the public, our patients, the public, to, to go ahead and get vaccinated because it makes sense. It's been long enough at this point, the people, the thousands and thousands of people who this was tested on, they're doing well. We know to a good degree of certainty what the effects are. And so it's time. It's time to go ahead and get vaccinated. The vaccine is our pathway out. That's the way that all of this is going to end and that's our best path back to being normal. Getting vaccinated, we do know that some of those mild side effects exist. Will you go over some of them? I know I listed them here on the screen. And um, and why do we get those? And and that's a good thing, right? It's it's a good thing that we're getting mild side effects. Why is that? 
Absolutely. So I know there's a lot of, you know, concern about I don't want to fall ill after getting the vaccine. And so the side effects that you see right here, of course, soreness, um, mild chills, body aches are very common. And I always like to give an example of something that I can understand. So um, I've been a dancer my whole life, ballet and jazz. And so the best way that I can describe this is it's a dress rehearsal for your body if it was to ever come into contact with COVID-19. So when you're experiencing chills, fatigue, it's your body's way of arming itself if it was to ever come into contact. And so although the, the symptoms are not, you know, something that we, we want to experience, the important thing to remember is they're very temporary and it's your body's way of protecting itself. So um, I, that's a good way to kind of find that fit with whoever you're working with on something that they can really embrace and understand and really channel that with, to compare side effects and why it's happening. Gotcha. Perfect. And when it comes to these mild side effects, um, these can be expected um, between any of the three vaccines, right? I know we don't want to hear, or sometimes we hear, excuse me, well, I'd rather get this one because my friend didn't have side effects with that one. I'd rather, but um, the, the side effects are mild and they could come from any of the three, right? Not, not preference over one or the other. Absolutely. And that goes back to, you know, the discussion of it's your body's way of arming itself. So with any of the vaccines, because it's a way to protect yourself, these side effects could potentially occur. But again, they're fleeting and it should provide a level of just comfort that you know you are now protecting yourself in hopes of not getting COVID-19. Gotcha. Another question that came in, what kind of response would you give to the people that compare the vaccine to testing on the Tuskegee Airmen? Um, we're talking about completely different sorts of situations. Uh, so the, the Tuskegee syphilis study was something that was very, very different. It was ethically wrong, but in a different direction. So what happened in the Tuskegee experiment was it was a natural study of men infected with syphilis. And the plan was to track them over their lives because there wasn't a treatment. We wanted to know how syphilis progressed, which is a perfectly reasonable thing to study. The problem is once the antibiotics became available, uh, instead of actually treating all those people, they allowed them to remain infected and follow them over time. So basically, they withheld treatment, a completely unethical thing to do, completely wrong. Uh, this is something that's very, very different. Right now, what we're talking about is a, a vaccine that we have been trying to be as transparent and as public about throughout this entire process. We went through the clinical trials. All that information has been released. It's approved by the FDA. Everybody knows about it. And now we are encouraging people to get vaccinated. We're not mandating anything. We're not tricking them in anything. We're not withholding treatment. We are trying to do something that will actually protect people and make this available to everybody. So, um, so they, they fall under the same issue of ethics, but they're very, very different situations and they're not really comparable. Well, as we all know, there is a significant disparity with vaccinations and people of color. The disparity exists for several reasons, and it definitely includes the history of mistrust that we have in the public health system. I would say it's important to take the time to invest in your health by reading the information available, ask questions, and start a conversation with your healthcare provider regarding your concerns. I feel confident in receiving this vaccination knowing that all ages, ethnicities, and races were part of these clinical trials. There is a great percentage of minorities that were part of the clinical trials, as well as we have people of color who helped develop these vaccines. That provides the additional confidence that I have in receiving this vaccine. But some people, even if they've been infected, they're at least, do they need a complete the dosage or the, the series? Yeah, we haven't really looked at it of what happens if you had natural disease plus one shot. Um, basically just get both doses. There's no reason not to get that second dose because mm -hmm. then you'd be considered fully immunized and protected against it. It's going to give you the strongest protection. It's not saying there's no protection with a single shot plus natural disease, but um, two shots are easy to get. It's safe and effective. So why not get the second one and be certain that you're actually protected? 
Um, another question that we get is, I already got COVID. Why do I need to get the vaccine? This is a common question that I receive as well. So if you have already um, contracted COVID-19, the, the issue is we're not sure how many antibodies, which are our level of protection, are still in your system. And so some patients have a high level and some actually have a low level. And so without knowing what that true state is, it really increases your risk for reinfection versus getting the vaccine that allows your body to have a more um, steady state of protection. So um, that's why we recommend it. Gotcha. Perfect. That's good to know. Now I've had some really tough experiences in ICU um, and some very memorable um, cases of young patients dying. Like we kind of see the same process for a lot of them. They go through the oxygen, they get the breathing tube, they get on, put on their stomachs. We give them meds to help remove fluid. I mean, it's, it's a vicious cycle. I had a 39 year old female who was unvaccinated um, in my ICU about two weeks ago. Um, and unfortunately she'd been there for weeks and um, to no avail. I mean, didn't get better. And of course it was really sad because she didn't want the breathing tube because she knew what it meant. So unfortunately for her, um, we tried our very best to keep her on the oxygen she was on, but we needed to put a breathing tube in. And not too long after that, she didn't make it for the greater good, for the collective good of, of our country and to get us back to normal that there's nothing more important right now or patriotic and um, better for us as a people than to get your vaccine so that we can return to normal. We are seeing an epidemic among the non-vaccinated people. COVID-19 is a lethal disease and if you survive it, a large number of those people will go on to have long lingering symptoms, kidney trouble, heart problems, lung problems. The disease is preventable with a vaccine that has minimal side effects for a day or two there's no reason to not be vaccinated. For the small inconvenience of a vaccine, you can save lives. What I've experienced as I've helped people understand about the vaccines is the inaccuracies that they've learned from Facebook or from their friends or online at any source, they, they're getting inaccuracies. So they get nervous. And so once I can help them understand the science, I can help them understand the studies, they've been able to really change their minds on some things. Well, I will say that I do understand the original skepticism of it. I mean, I took a little bit of time to get mine. I was one of the later rounds for nurses to get my vaccine. But I understand, you know, there's a lot of mistrust from science to government. The facts are the facts. You know, we see what we see and we know that for sure, people have long-term consequences of COVID or they die. So I would say that, you know, if there's any concern with mistrust, I think the focus should be shifted to doing what's greater for the collective good. I know that not everyone kind of has that view. That's my view anyway. Vaccine science is a proven science. It can help us get through this better as a population.